So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think we cover all time zones today for the intergenerational panel on finding hope in the climate peace disarmament nexus. Uh, my name is Rebecca Schutte. I'm the executive director of Citizens for Global Solutions, one of three co-hosting co organizations for today's event, along with Youth Fusion and the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. We hope that today's event will consider how progress on environmental protection is hampered by an armed conflict, nuclear threats, and the massive diversion of resources into weapons and war. While these three issues have been contemplated as the existential threats facing humanity and our planet itself, we also hope that today's panel will offer some solutions and some hope and animation to guide us going forward. And before I begin with more explanation of how today's program will run, and introductions of our wonderful panelists. I'll pass it to my wonderful co-host, Vanda Proshkova, who is the co-founder of Youth Fusion for a little bit of preliminaries and housekeeping uh, to guide us through today's event. Vanda? Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and hello, everyone. It's such an honor and pleasure to be here and to see that so many people are interested in the climate peace disarmament nexus. That's that's wonderful. Um, the idea for this event started a couple of months ago when Drea, who's not visible on the screen, but she's here, we're chatting about the role of youth and young people in the different UN, but also civil society fora. Um, and then we just thought, you know, why not just go big? Um, so it's it's awesome that we managed to get all the different also co-sponsors on board. And now, now we're here. So as Rebecca has mentioned, um, I'll just have two things on the housekeeping side um, that I would like to mention. As you all know, this is um, organized in the form of a webinar, Zoom webinar, meaning we have the Q&A box open. Um, we'll do of course, the Q&A with our wonderful panelists. So if you have any questions for them, please, please use the Q&A box, not the chat. Um, this is so that we and the panelists can see the questions and can look at them and then answer them later. Um, but of course, we also have the chats enabled. So if you have any comments or additional links or just want to say hi, say where you're turning in from, please use the chat for that. Um, we are recording this and the chat will also be available later. Um, so anything you put in can be can be stored. Um, and that brings me to my last point that I want to mention. Please uh, make sure to be respectful. Again, this is being recorded. Uh, the chat will be saved and then shared later. So just make sure that everyone's being respected and kind to one another. Um, I think that's it. Back, back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Vonda. Um, so before we begin, um, I acknowledge that I'm coming to you from CGS's headquarters in Washington, D.C., on the ancestral and unceded land of the Anacostan people. As we reflect on the challenges that are intersectional facing tomorrow's future, we also reflect on the past. Um, the way that today's program is going to proceed is in pairings. We have an embarrassment of riches um, with our speakers, who I'll introduce briefly before we begin the program, and then we will have what we hope to be a very interactive and robust question and answer and comment um, portion of the agenda. Um, before we begin, I do have to acknowledge our co-hosting organizations, World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy and Youth Fusion. We also have a voluminous list of co-sponsoring organizations that I apologize uh, is too lengthy to, to um, indicate orally. And so my colleague is going to put that in the chat so you can learn more about our organizations. I also want to acknowledge the contributions to today's program of Drea Klein-Bergman, the Director of Programs at Citizens for Global Solutions. Um, my dear colleague, and um, my uh, co-conspirator um, at uh, World, World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, the Director of Programs, Alan Ware. We are also joined on the back end um, by two wonderful new members of the Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament team, Vanessa Lantain and Holly Crawford, and from CGS, Alex Andre. Now uh, to introduce very briefly our illustrious cast of characters from whom you'll be hearing today. We, in alphabetical order, they will be paired according to theme. Um, first, Kekishan Basu, who hails from the United Arab Emirates and Canada. Kekishan is the founder and president of Green Hope Foundation, the United Nations human rights champion and winner of the 2016 International Children's Peace Prize. She's a council member of the World Future Council, former UNEP, uh, United Nations Environmental Program, Global Coordinator for Children and Youth. Uh, next, we have Marie-Claire Graf from Switzerland. 
She is the co-founder of the Youth Negotiators Academy and Climate Youth Negotiator Program, as well as the Youth, UN Youth Climate Champion of Switzerland. We have Professor Maya Graf from, the Canada, from Canada and the Netherlands, who is the convener of the Climate Governance Commission, visiting professor and scholar of fa at the Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs at Leiden University, and lecturer at the Hague Academy of International Law. Um, Bill Pace from the United States, founder and inaugural convener of the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, former executive director of WFM IGP, and co-founder of the International Coalition for the Responsibility to Protect. Next, we have Professor Jürgen Schäfrin from Germany, Professor of Integrative Geography, Chair of the Research Group of Climate Change, Center for the Earth System Research and Sustainability at the University of Hamburg. He's also the principal author of the Climate Nuclear Nexus. And last but certainly not least, Michaela Hicken Sorensen from Denmark and South Africa, the Youth Fusion Co-Convener, Program Officer of PEEP and D's Gender Peace and Security Program and Campaign Manager at DocMine. And if you think that was a handful, that's only a little snippet of the wonderful accolades um, and um, uh, acumen that our uh, respected panelists bring to the table. So starting us off with our first panel, it's my honor uh, to bring Bill Pace, who, uh, in whose footsteps many of us follow as the co-convener of the Washington Working Group for the International Criminal Court. We owe you a tremendous debt, Bill. Um, in many senses, I think the founding father of coalition building on the global governance spectrum. And it's very fitting that you're coming to us at this particular time, as Monday we will commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Rome Statute, which you were so instrumental to bringing about. Um, Bill is also joined in this first pairing by Kekishan. Kekishan, in addition to the brief bio that I um, uh, earlier read off, has been an environmental and human rights activist since a very early age, from planting trees and organizing young people at eight to today leading on a global stage. Kekushan shows us a future that I hope will be optimistic and uh, engage, engage our audience today. So Kekushan and Bill, I'd like to start out with a very general question about how civil society can utilize current avenues to organize. We have a couple of critical events coming up in the forms of the Summit of the Future, and also, um, as we know, the SDG Summit, which is organized by the UN. One of those is coming up this year, one of those is coming up next year. Both provide opportunities to rally civil society around calls for action, both on climate and on peace and disarmament issues. I can give a little bit more background on the SDG Summit, which marks the midpoint of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. The 2024 Summit of the Future has its origins as the UN's 75th anniversary commemoration. This is also very timely as this week and next, the high level political forum on the SDGs is convening in New York, which I know some of our um, participants today will take part in. So Kekishan and Bill, uh, the first question to you would be, how can we use these milestones to organize and rally civil society around joint goals of climate action, peace, and disarmament? Did you want me to go first? As you wish, Bill. Why don't you go first? You came off moot first. All right. Well, thank you very much, and good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, uh, I think it is uh, extremely important to have these types of international uh, panels and communications. Um, I think you know, I start with the large view that the World Federalist Movement has had for 70, 80 years now, that the, the vital importance for the human race and humanity to uh, make peace with itself, with each other, Secondly, we have to make peace with the rest of life on this planet. And third, we have to make peace with the planet. And on the uh, first issue of uh, uh, peace with humanity, it's very important. I think recently the uh, declarations by uh, in the inventors and developers of 
uh, generational artificial intelligence, the relationship between this confrontation that the human race needs to face and even a nuclear uh, war and, and disarmament. In, in this regard, I'll give one recommendation that I've been sharing with people. This is a 25 minute uh, speech by um, Yasuf Noah Harari uh, on artificial intelligence and the future of humanity, which is on YouTube and which I think prevents presents a overview of the crisis that, that humanity is going to face with this and its relevance to ecology, um, to environment, uh, to preventing nuclear war and, and, to, and for global governance. Second point I wanna make is um, I do believe that for the future of the UN, the sustainable development goals and implementation, almost all of this has come through the network of the United Nations system. And I think we still need to do everything we can to take advantage of the United Nations. In particular, uh, the General Assembly of the United Nations, which has on many, many instances in the last 25 years, adopted resolutions and decisions uh, that the permanent members of the Security Council and the most powerful members in the, in the world have opposed, but they have prevailed. So I think we need to continue to work within the framework of the General Assembly of the UN and to avoid relying on the permanent five or the hegemonic uh, political forces. Second, uh, we have demonstrated over the last 40 years that like-minded groups of governments, some starting with three or four governments uh, on sustainable development, on climate change, and then gradually developing into coalitions of uh, more than two thirds of the UN. And recently the resolutions dealing with the aggression in Ukraine have been securing uh, over 150 uh, supporters at the UN, which is uh, 15, 20 more than the two thirds uh, of the UN. And I think that is, is very important. Uh, but like-minded coalitions of governments from all regions and like-minded coalitions that in give political uh, and consultative space to civil society and global civil society, I think are fundamentally important. Second, that the uh, to use the, the regional organization framework, the European Union, the African Union, the Organization of America States, ASEAN, that all of these uh, multilateral institutions that I think will be required to take leadership roles at the regional and sub-regional level, sub-regional level like the West African uh, ECOWAS uh, 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 forum, et cetera. Uh, the last point I wanna make is that we will not achieve uh, any satisfactory approach until the, the global corporate uh, uh, hegemonies themselves uh, are subordinated to regulation uh, and, and political uh, direction. And, and one of the main ways I believe this will be achieved will be to finally put into place something like a, a global security and exchange commission, which also could be the, the, the basis for uh, raising global funds for uh, climate change, disarmament, uh, and all of the important areas of global governance, if humanity is going to survive the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, and from Bill, who mobilized more than 1,000 organizations to join the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, Inter Alia, uh, to Kekishan, who now has more than, I think, 3,000 members in total of your Green Hope Foundation across the world, mobilizing for implementation of the SDGs. Kekishan, how do we bring uh, this um, movement how do we people power the movement that can seem sometimes so large and these questions so existential and the challenges so huge? How do you connect to the grassroots level as you've so effectively done with the Green Hope Foundation? Absolutely, thank you very much. And you know, now we have an outreach of over half a million people in 28 countries. And 
And it's just really amazing to see the power that people have on the ground to bring about change. And since we were talking about the effectiveness of summits earlier, I'm actually on my way back to Toronto from the high level political forum where yesterday I delivered the NGO statement at uh, the SDG 9 plenary on industry innovation and infrastructure. And I'll, I'll be back at the HLPF next week as well. And, and I really think that these summits first are just a wonderful way of encouraging knowledge sharing as a way to get the dialogue started with stakeholders who might not have been involved with them in the past to raise awareness about, for instance, why nuclear disarmament is such an important issue, and most importantly, highlighting intersectionalities with other challenges that might not have been discussed before. Now, that is at the more, like a high level, the summit level. When we take it down more to the grassroots level with civil society and other stakeholders who, again, might not have been engaged in the uh, movement before, the first thing to understand there is that there is a tremendous lack of awareness surrounding the nuclear abolition discourse. And this, of course, has a lot to do with uh, the taboo and the veil of secrecy that uh, nuclear states and the arms industry have perpetrated to keep civil society and other stakeholders away from knowing about all of the harms that nuclear weapons bring about and the whole process of nuclear injustice. And, you know, we still have seven years to go till 2030. That's that's a long time and long enough for, say, 11 year old to graduate from school, 11 year old now to graduate from school in 2030 and enter higher education. So the way we at Green Hope Foundation have utilized these past years of the SDGs and since their inception and what we can do moving forward till Agenda 2030 reaches its target date is, of course, using disarmament education, which we work extensively on, not just for school-age children, but also for those in higher ed, those in elementary school, young professionals in industry, professionals, governments, really everyone to really remove this veil of secrecy that does exist. And through disarmament education, we use that as a way to educate people about all of the intersectionalities that do exist within the nuclear movement and within nuclear disarmament and nuclear weapons, and particularly the climate nuclear nexus and peace in that regard, because there's so much that people don't know about just how pervasive this full uh, this movement has been like for nuclear weapons and how it has fostered climate inequity all around the world. And through disarmament education, we are ensuring that we are able to get our current generation and our next generation educated enough and aware enough to make sure that they don't make the same mistakes of the past. They are they know what is right and really moving ahead with that education and those skill sets to create a better world for all. So any any kind of action requires, you know, you need to have knowledge to be able to act. And in this case, disarmament education is absolutely key and it's absolutely critical as well in order to address other issues such as climate inequity, gender inequity, racial inequity, and all of the other uh, pre-existing inequalities that already existed in our world. So Kekushan, if I could um, pick up a little bit on some of the points that you made there without in any way ignoring the immediacy and the urgency um, of, of these ills, looking forward and recognizing that this is a generational enterprise, the current SDGs have been criticized as being quite weak on peace and disarmament and not really making the connection and recognize the intersectionality between those issues and the climate change and sustainable development goals. Um, so going forward beyond the 2030 SDGs, what do you see about how the climate peace nuclear nexus could be better addressed, learning from the MDGs to the SDGs and what comes after 2030? I'll go to Kekishan first on that. Yeah, I, I would once again advocate very heavily for disarmament education at really all levels because, again, there is this lack of awareness that does exist. And you know, I was part of the negotiations that led up to the adoption of the SDGs. And I clearly remember just how powerful the nuclear states were in ensuring that you know they did 
government or anything like that to be there. And also a lot of other member states uh, pushing back on a lot of important issues that should have been there uh, within the SDGs, apart from nuclear disarmament as well. So I think that uh, the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, I think that was kind of a wake-up call for a lot of people as to how nuclear weapons do exist and how a nuclear war can very quickly become a reality if we're not careful. I think with a generation that's more connected now than ever before, like technology and social media has definitely played a role in kind of helping spread that message of how nuclear war can, is possible because we have these nuclear weapons at hand and why it's so important to uh, abolish nuclear weapons right now. So that is where disarmament education kind of, kind of comes in to uh, really bring forward that nexus to the forefront of everyone's minds and most definitely to the minds of the policymakers and the negotiators who would be really creating this uh, agenda within the United Nations. And uh, on top of that, again, this is, is seven years uh, we have to achieve the SDGs and uh, the targets. I think that with the generation that is now kind of growing up uh, with all of this knowledge and in 2030 would be off age to become policymakers themselves and have the knowledge themselves to bring about change. I, I think that, again, having them aware right from the get-go is like really, really important. And once we kind of get it into the school's curriculums, university curriculums, and with our organizations working on the ground to raise greater awareness about how nuclear disarmament is related to climate change, to all of the other inequities that exist in our world, I think there is hope that we would be able to create uh, a new set of targets that actually recognize why nuclear disarmament is so important and how it really cuts across all the other issues. And I see hope as well in terms of how the MDGs went from just eight goals uh, to the SDGs, which went 17 goals and 169 targets. A lot of people said that that was way too much, but there are so many different intersectionalities that exist. It's important to have all of these different goals that take into account these unique challenges that people around the world uh, face and communities around the world face. So nuclear disarmament definitely is one of them. Uh, seeing how the progress is going now, it does give me a bit of hope. And I see ho that hope uh, in our current generation uh, that does it, knowing how bad nuclear weapons are. And in our last minute, um, uh, back to Bill. So Bill, you've been through several epochs of global cooperation from um, when the ICC itself seemed chimerical to the MDGs, to the SDGs and beyond. Uh, we have linked to the video that you mentioned in terms of the next one of the next challenges and opportunities facing humanity, facing our globe, um, uh, the prospect of AI. Would you like to elaborate on how you see the world after the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and what areas, areas you think we should be organizing around? Sorry, Rebecca, it looks like it looks like Bill got kicked off. Um, he disappeared. All right, well, I hope that we'll be able to pick that up with Bill in the question and answer discussion portion of our agenda. Kakshan, thank you so much for this introductory remark. Uh, set of remarks. Um, and so I'm going to pass the baton to my co-host Vanda for our next pairing. Lovely. Thank you so much. And also just wanted to say thank you to Kekashan. You know, um, precisely hearing about the hope, that's exactly what's making me stay in this field and keep pushing forward exactly people like you and all the youths who are fighting for uh, the good change in the world. So thank you for joining us. Um, well, now it's time to dive more a little bit deeper into the whole climate peace nuclear nexus with our next pairing of Professor Jorgen Schiffran from Germany and Mikhail Higgins Sorensen. Um, aside from um, the impressive um, titles that were mentioned for both of these, um, I would just like to um, recognize the Climate Nuclear Nexus publish, publication, uh, which Professor Jorgen was the principal author of. Um, it was published by World Future Council, and I would just put in a second the link to that into the chat. 
and would just really encourage all of the attendees to take a look at it because it's it's a really a great a great read. Um, and just to add a little bit of um, background for Michaela as well, um, she's a co-convener of Youth Fusion, and at Youth Fusion, our goal is precisely to link new grid settlements to the broader sustainable development goals. So I'm really happy that we have this extremely well-informed pair to answer our two prepared questions. Um, with the first one, and we. Uh, I feel like we've already touched upon this a little bit, um, but um, the climate peace and nuclear nexus is sometimes, if not most of the times, uh, considered in a rather negative way. So we constantly hear that um, military spending and the nuclear arms race threaten the climate and then vice versa, climate change increases conflict, right? But the question we thought would be good to ask was in what specific ways can these connections between these two issues be advanced in a positive way? So, for example, how can we highlight that progress on peace can enhance progress on climate protection and, and vice versa? I mean, after all, these movements do face mutually shared challenges. Um, so who, who would like to uh, give it a go first? Michaela muted herself. Go ahead. Yes, there we go. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, for having me here today. It's really an honor to be among such great company and among so many distinguished speakers. Um, so thank you so much again. And, you know, in answering this question, I really loved it when I received it, um, because my answer is, you know, surround yourself with good people, uh, join a community. Community is really everything. Uh, people make up these movements. People make action. So really surround yourself, find your community and really, you know, get a good foundation and a good support system uh, and do your research. You know, you know, everyone can be an activist, um, but not everyone, you know, has the tools to really be a, a well-informed activist, which is why Youth Fusion really, you know, provides a platform and a network to sort of equip, uh, especially young people, uh, to know the facts. Uh, we have a lot of different um, resources from articles to webinars to podcasts uh, to really inform people. Uh, and, you know, in a nutshell, my answer to this question is really also have fun with it. Uh, find your talent um, and really see what your strengths are. And then, you know, look at what you can provide to the community. For example, I can talk for hours. So I just do a lot of podcasts with experts and learn from them. Uh, I actually had one earlier this week with um, a young PhD student called uh, Janis uh, Kappelmann from the University of Hamburg, and we talked a lot about feminist foreign policy, about uh, colonization and how it's heavily linked to uh, the nuclear weapons um, space as well, and we just had a great time. I learned so much from him, uh, and, you know, I keep doing this to learn more. Um, so really find your community, um, equip yourself with knowledge, and really have fun while you're doing it because activism is really exhausting. No matter what space you're in, if you're in academia, NGO, uh, if you're a policymaker, things, these are really heavy topics. Uh, they're existential crises as we're dealing with both nuclear weapons and, um, and climate change here. So you need to really <laughs> make sure that you don't have a burnout. Um, and I think at Youth Fusion, we're really good at doing that. We're great at, at having fun. We have a really good relationship with everyone in our leadership and our network. Um, we all try to have as much fun as possible while we're doing the hard work. Um, and just to sort of explain a little bit about what our goals are. Uh, so we really try to inform, educate, connect, and engage with, um, with young people, uh, especially. That's why we're Youth Fusion, uh, because we really believe, as uh, Kekeshan was saying, um, that there's a lot of hope in young people. You know, young people are the ones who are going to inherit our future. And, you know, we have a right to our future that is peaceful, that is, you know, not burning up in flames uh, and, you know, a right to a, a good, healthy environment. Um, and that's really, you know, what drives us at Youth Fusion. And, you know, we really have a little bit of a twist in our approach, um, which I think is quite progressive of us. Uh, where we always take an intersectional approach, an interdisciplinary approach, and also, very importantly, an intergenerational approach. Even though we are youth fusion, we're still very much interested in learning from people who are more seasoned in the field. Um, there's so much to learn, and we've learned so much from our elders in the field who've been doing this for a long time. Um, so I think, you know, not to, to toot our own horns here, but I think that youth fusion really 
answers this question for itself. Um, we, we have a lot of fun. We have a great community. We do our research. We connect with people, engage with people from all walks of life, from all ages. Um, and that's really what uh, is the recipe to our success, I think. Thank you, Mikhail, and thank you for being here with us. Jürgen, what is what is your recipe for success? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Vanu. Uh, this is a great opportunity to look at the positive side, not only on the negative nexus um, that we have. Um, you're all aware that the world is in crisis, and one region is that uh, the expansionist uh, model that uh, we all experience over the last couple of centuries is reaching limits, it's planetary limits and boundaries. It's also social, political uh, limits and economic limits. And we have to deal with these limits um, to avoid further crisis. And so one, one important message is, of course, to, to accept these limits and deal with these limits and live within these limits um, to, to find a way of uh, survival. And this implies that we have to live with each other, but among human beings, but we have to also live with nature. So the UN Secretary General has called, we have to end the war against nature. We have to uh, work towards peace with nature. So basically reversing all the negative trends, uh, in particular, this, this very negative nexus of uh, growth, political power, concentration, and, and violence, just by reversing it, uh, moving to a positive nexus of uh, yeah, peace, uh, sustainability, and uh, development, uh, we call, or can also put this under the headline of sustainable peace. We have a long tradition of peace, and the, the peace concept is basically uh, developed to preserve the basic integrity of the society. And uh, the, the, the sustainability concept has similar notions. It's about protection of nature and the relationship to nature. So both sustainability and peace uh, go together. and can learn a lot uh, from each other, that we can uh, move away from this vicious cycle that we are facing of the um, climate uh, conflict uh, nexus to the climate peace nexus. Uh, that means that political solutions have to develop synergies among each other. So in the past, we have many political fields independently from each other. For instance, there was security policy, there was economic policy, there is environmental policy and uh, migration policy and so on. So these different sectors uh, were just developing their own strategies and were, which were sometimes contradictory to each other. There were trade-offs between the different policy fields, but we need to move forward towards thinking about the possible synergies, uh, for instance, between um, security and peace policy and environmental policy, uh, for instance, by um, using environmental the solution of environmental problems as a peace building process. This is called environmental peace building. That's a, a prominent concept now in the uh, conflict research. This means that people at the local level as well as uh, national and international level use the solution of the environmental problems to work together. Uh, working together to find solutions to environmental problems is a peace building mechanism in itself. It helps to build institutions it brings people together, uh, for instance, on water sharing and uh, uh, sharing of other resources. And this is part of the social ecological transformation that we are currently facing, um, which needs to be complemented by conflict transformation. So it's a double transformation that we are facing, social ecological and uh, uh, conflict transformation. That means in, in the social ecological transformation, we also need to um, deal with the conflicts and avoid the conflicts. Uh, um, otherwise, even the, the climate policies like adaptation and mitigation cannot avoid the conflicts if we don't think about conflict resolution in the climate policy uh, arena and field. So we, we need to think about uh, uh, different leverage points. Leverage points um, are the, the, the strategies that have the biggest effect in different fields. And also we need to think about multi-scale connections of the movements communities, businesses, governments, transnational initiatives and international organizations, they all, they all need to work together. And uh, one example is of course that uh, disarmament is, uh, is good for the environment, um, simply for the same reason that an, an arms race and the military buildup is bad for the environment. 
because it's damaging the environment, it costs a lot of resources, has a negative effect on climate. So avoiding the arms race and uh, working towards nuclear disarmament is a major contribution to free, free the resources for the environmental field, as well as for, for other uh, fields. This should not only be done at the theoretical level, but uh, at the practical level, we need to have uh, yeah, enabling mechanisms yeah, to give power to the people and uh, evolving practices in these different fields through practical cooperation and participation at the local level uh, to support capacity building and social networking. So um, yeah, the enabling of people is a very important aspect of bringing power to the people that the power is not only at the big corporations and the, 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 the national governments, but the people need to take the power into their own hands. And they can do it best by working together in these different uh, fields and arenas that I described. So much for now. Thank you. And thank you also for, for saying that the two fields can really learn from each other. That is bridging very well to our next question, actually, which is um, diving even deeper um, into this a specific tool um, specifically divestment. Divestment, as as you both know, has proved to be a an efficient an efficient tool, especially in the area of fossil fuels. Could we also apply it to nuclear weapons and talk about nuclear divestment? And I hear I'm trying to stay on time, but Jorgen, would you like to give the first answer? Yeah, money makes the world go round. And uh, for that reason, also, it's a major driver in this negative nexus. Yeah, it's a, it's a big driver in this uh, link between economic growth, political power, and violence, because all of them need money and investment. And uh, reducing the investment into military from the military sector, in particular for nuclear weapons, is an important aspect. And there are various campaigns worldwide that to try to reduce investment and they have been part partly um, successful. Yeah, there should be no banking on the bomb, for instance, and no business with uh, nuclear weapons dealers and producers. And uh, this is simply because mili the military complex as well as the nuclear complex uh, are very um, uh, much in, in demand and need of uh, a lot of money. I mean, the, the whole nuclear arms race of the Cold War has, has cost several um, yeah, trillion uh, of US dollar, and even after the end of the Cold War, um, several trillion have been spent uh, on, on the nuclear arms race. And uh, for that reason, um, if you make clear that the pension funds, for instance, are not used in this military sector, this is an important part uh, because uh, hundreds of billions of, of dollars spent in this, uh, this, this field and sometimes those who uh, take care of the pensions are not aware that their money is actually used yeah, um, in the uh, military and nuclear sectors. And here, little information, a little campaigning can help to make this pub no, uh, known to the public as well uh, to the funding organizations, because many of these funding organizations are not, uh, not, not interested in uh, supporting nuclear weapons and nuclear war. Thank, thank you for that. Michaela, would you like to add to this? Yeah, also not to repeat too much. I think that uh, Jürgen really put it out there very well. There's so much money that is pumped into these industries, whether it's you know fossil fuels or nuclear weapons. Uh, just for example, uh, over the next 10 years, there's going to be an estimated 1 trillion US dollars uh, uh, invested in nuclear weapons. And you know, I think as part of the whole, you know, effort to educate people and make them aware of this uh, and really frame it in such a way that, hey, this investment is taking away from your human rights. Uh, for example, you know, this money, it's it's tech with nuclear weapons. A lot of it is is tax money. Like if your country like the US uh, has nuclear weapons, it's part of the um, government's military uh, expenditure budget. So that money could much rather be spent on, you know, helping the post-pandemic recovery, ending poverty, protect, protecting the climate, uh, building global peace, and also, you know, it could be really useful with all the sustainable development goals and also post-2030 uh, agenda. Um, so I think at the end of the day, when it comes to these investments, it does become a little bit of a zero-sum game. 
um, you actually, you lose out on so much, even, um, you know, I live in Denmark, I pay my taxes in Denmark, and, you know, some of our banks invest in nuclear weapons. Um, so, you know, really do your research and check because you vote with your money, you vote with your votes, uh, and really try to, you know, do some research on how you're contributing and how you might be investing in nuclear weapons without even knowing it. Um, I can see Alan has put in the chat, uh, Alan Wall put in, uh, move the nuclear weapons money campaign. Uh, as Jürgen said, uh, campaigning is a very good way to alert the public to this. Uh, so please have a look at that uh, move the ne a nuclear weapons money campaign. Um, and also, if you just want to do a bit of research about what entities in your country, you know, might be investing in, in nuclear weapons, uh, I'll just put don't bank in, uh, on the bomb in the chat, uh, because you'd be surprised at how many banks, universities, and other institutions actually uh, pump money into this uh, military industrial complex, and that is nuclear weapons. Um, so do your research, uh, educate yourself, and, and also just make sure that you are not uh, contributing to this, because I think with the climate and, and you know, environmental stuff, it's a little bit more obvious to us, you know, eat plant-based, you know, invest in sustainable products, uh, fair trade, all these things, uh, but with nuclear weapons, it's a very, very hidden, as Kekishan was also saying, a lot of uh, secrecy involved there, so uh, do some research, we provide you with links. <laughs> Thank you so much for your enlightening answer. And just a reminder before I pass it over to Rebecca, um, that all attendees have access to the Q&A box. So if you also would like to ask yourself anything, well, anything relevant <laughs> to any of our panelists, please put your uh, questions to the chat and we'll make sure to get to them later in today's program. Okay, thank you again, both Jorgen and Michaela and Rebecca, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Vonda. Um, picking up a little bit just first on the, the set of speakers' last points, um, if you're in my jurisdiction, and I see we have at least folks from Bangladesh, Ukraine, Pakistan, the Shetland Islands, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Denmark, Canada, the Republic of Georgia, and Kenya, and I'm sorry if I'm missing anybody, but if you happen to be in the United States, it's a very interesting time to look at military spending. Um, currently, the National Defense Authorization Act, which could authorize up to $886 billion in military spending, uh, is being debated by Congress. If you'd like to learn more about that and you are a U.S. national or you want or you simply are interested, um, please comment in the chat and we'll get back to that. Moving over to our last pair of panelists, last but certainly not least, it's my delight to introduce Maya Groff. Maya and uh, CGS have been seeing a lot of each other. Thank you so much, Maya, for your contributions to our last book club. And we will include the link to your most recent work in the chat. Maya is an international lawyer based in The Hague, who has assisted in the development and servicing of multilateral treaties. She also has worked at various international criminal tribunals and teaches regularly at the Hague Academy of International Law. Um, we're also joined by Marie-Claire Garoff, who is a young advocate working for a livable future. She's a global change maker and a speaker around sustainable development and ambitious climate action. And I would also invite our speakers to put your social media uh, platforms uh, as, as you wish um, into the chat so that our participants may know where to reach you in addition to your organizational platforms. Um, so I will kick it off for a question to either of our speakers, um, which is that the peace and disarmament movement and the environmental movement um, both run adjacent to one another, often intersecting, often complementary, but sometimes one seems to be working at a higher tempo or rate of success. What could one learn from the other and which do you think is accelerating more quickly right now? Um, I'll go to whomever comes off mute first. I think we're both off mute. Mary Claire, why don't you go ahead first? <laughs> well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. And specifically what you just outlined to kind of bring these different um, thematics together because ultimately they inherently um, challenge the same systems we are seeing, the same oppressions, but also the same solutions. Yet very often um, these thematics operate in silos, especially when we look in the multilateral world where there are different delegations and different NGOs focusing on one or the other side. And unfortunately there are very little um, NGOs, but also 
delegates who are looking in the in-between and actually see how we can bring these thematics together. And I think this is already one of the challenges we are seeing um, that, for example, in the last couple of years, due to the uh, the accelerated impact and the devastating impact of, of the climate crisis, we have been seeing that there is a momentum around the climate agenda, yet very often, for example, biodiversity, nature is left behind. Um, and we are not seeing the same traction when it comes, for example, to the Biodiversity Convention, because there's also a COP, but when we talk about the COPs, everyone thinks about climate, but actually there are many other COPs which no one talks about. There's also one on desertification. There are many others actually now coming up, somewhat like one on plastic, and, and also there are others on chemical waste and so on. Um, so just saying this, that very often also like our own framing is kind of already biased towards one. Um, and specifically like looking then out of the more natural science environmental space and kind of seeing how this interrelates with with um, with peace, disarmament, there is very, very little intersection given within the governance system we are having um, because these um, delegations, these NGOs don't meet the same place, they're not really having any forums to interrelate. I mean, Kegashan mentioned in the beginning, the high level political forum is one of these forums where actually these thematics interrelate. Nevertheless, at least when I took part in it, very often, again, like there are different rooms. You, if you go follow SDG 13, you go in this room. If you follow SDG 6 or whatever SDG you're following, you go to another room and people, again, don't talk with each other. There's very rare that actually um, the, these delegations come together. And I think what is important that uh, because uh, climate has been gaining a certain traction um, within a variety of fields, within national like member states, governments, but also within civil society, but also independent movements, for example, also the youth movements, Friday for Future, and many other, um, even going into civil disobedience with, with, with um, Extinction Rebellion and many other movements. I think it's important um, that then also these interrelated intersectional topics get highlighted. I know like not everyone um, likes that this kind of, that we also divert into the thematics, but I think it's very, very important to see how this is interrelated also to fem feminine um, policies, for example, or, or feminine oppression, how this is interrelated um, to, to extraction of minerals, how this is interrelated to disarmament, how this is interrelated to racism. And um, so I think we have to use these momentums to, to highlight the intersections to other thematics and invite these thematics also to come um, into play. But I don't think this is enough. And I think one really crucial point, which Maya maybe will talk about, is how we can also like then shift this into the governance space and how we can ensure that this is also then addressed on a governance level. Because raising awareness is the first step, but if the raising awareness doesn't lead into action and implementation um, and into frameworks which actually allow us to move forward, it's very, very challenging to bring this really to round. And we talked about the seven years left and midway through with the SDGs. And I really do believe that we need governance change to be able to work on these thematics more intersectionally, which unfortunately hasn't been, or let's say like the progress was very, very slow in this regard, but very happy now to hear um, what Maya um, has to answer. Maybe like, yeah, we have even some more corresponding dialogues. As we move to, to Maya, to your answer, um, I, I'm, uh, I'm reflecting on uh, Marie Claire, the fact that you brought in and, and thank you for bringing in more intersectionalities, issues of gender. Um, we have been speaking about climate change. We haven't actually talked about other kinds of climate or excuse me, environmental injustice and degradation. So how can we respect these intersectionalities, Maya, while also being concrete, explicit and specific in our action items? Yeah, well, first to uh, give some comments on the question about, you know, what movement seems to have the most momentum at the moment, disarmament and peace or climate. I just wanted to give some observations, you know, from my generation when I was a child in the 1980s and, you know, a young person early 1990s, for example, the peace movement was much stronger, peace and disarmament. It was very vigorous. Uh, as a child, I remember being involved with all sorts of um, different events and, and, and uh, like international cooperation, uh, citizen exchanges. Um, so, so, you know, I think the peace mo movement has lost some momentum um, in, in recent decades. And of course, climate uh, as an urgent, increasingly urgent concern has, has gained a lot of momentum. But of course, there is the quote unquote intersectionality or, or really the huge risks uh, to all populations across the world uh, in, in terms of both issues, uh, peace, disarmament, uh, uh, nuclear weapons risk, uh, which are very, very live and very acute. And I don't think uh, many young people, for example, really um, realize that in populations around the world. So um, there's the question of funding, which is 
a key issue for the climate and ecological movements. How do we get the financing to mobilize the needed energy transition, uh, finance uh, urgent mitigation and adaptation efforts in the climate space? And uh, some of you may know that uh, international military spending has now uh, gone beyond $2 trillion uh, dollars, uh, per year for the first time. So these are huge sums, which we're collectively basically wasting on uh, an old style of uh, national uh, defense, national quote unquote security. Whereas if we had built up our uh, collective security mechanisms, international rule of law, getting into the governance proposals, concrete governance proposals that could help across the board, across these international risk areas, um, if we had done our homework and really built up our international governance architecture, uh, we'd be in a much, much, much better place on, on both of these issues. And, and just one more um, point on the intersection uh, of, of the two huge risk areas for humanity. Uh, firstly, um, there's the question, of course, of military, there's the funding question, but then there's military emissions around the world, which, which are not reported officially by states in terms of their, their emissions reporting and tracking. So <laughs> there's, there's implications for our carbon budget for military uh, activities currently. Uh, also, in terms of our accelerating uh, climate crisis and extreme weather events, that we're facing around the world and increasingly so as we move deeper into the climate crisis, we will need our military capacity around the world, national militaries, to actually assist civilians and in disaster response. We're already seeing this around the world. So we also have to think about how we refit, retrofit, you know, our, our military forces to, to really grapple with uh, these current ecological challenges. I have a colleague, uh, a friend who's a journalist, German, uh, Amer uh, Canadian, who's suggested to repurpose the military initiative. Um, you know, how can militaries around the world be used to implement the SDGs um, and also uh, to respond to our deepening climate crisis? And just one last intersecting point, and this is also why I'm involved in developing a new international anti corruption court, is that, you know, how we manage our, our you know, military budgets, how we build international peace and cooperation and sound mechanisms, how we manage the climate crisis, how we deal with corruption and indeed ensure that you know, our, our states are free of, of corruption is about good leadership that we need urgently now also to grapple with our intersecting global risks. So good leaders, the kind of leaders that we need will address this, this spectrum of, of very, very serious uh, issues uh, and, and they're very, very much interlinked. And then we can talk more about the governance piece, uh, but there are measures and there are really concrete mechanisms <laughs> that we can decrease the you know, military security risks at the international level, strengthen uh, peaceful settlement of disputes, international rule of law. There are very, very concrete governance steps we can take uh, in order to uh, ensure that states can decrease their military spending in ways that are unprecedented. So I just flag that from the international governance perspective. And many of those measures also would improve our global climate and ecological governance as well. Uh, thank you so much, Maya, Marie-Claire. I'm glad that you've been able to rejoin us. I apologize for the uh, connectivity issues. Um, I am very glad that you raised the issue of corruption because, of course, any global solution that we proffer is um, only as viable as its foundation is, is not rotting. Um, and so corruption and anti-corruption initiatives being embedded into any of these solutions is absolutely essential. You, in your recent book, once again, plugging um, global governance and the emergence of global institutions for the 21st century, which you will see linked in the chat. Um, I think it has been already, but will be again, um, offer several modalities for global institutions to confront the issues of climate, uh, confront the issues of nuclear threat, um, peace, um, 
one thing that Marie Claire mentioned earlier in her remarks is the siloing, um, the stratification of many of these institutions, um, both those that exist and extent today and those uh, that are proposed for future. Can you speak a little bit to not only some of the models that you propose in the book and elsewhere, but how they interrelate to one another? And then I'll come back to Marie Claire giving you time to come back online. Thank you so much for rejoining us. Great, yeah, I'll try to be uh, quite brief. So um, our book proposes quite uh, ambitious uh, uh, steps forward. How can we upgrade the UN Charter from its you know, 1945 incarnation? It has not been uh, reformed, looked at in terms of serious revision for over 75 years now, despite it, uh, uh, you know, the intention in the charter text itself was that it was supposed to be revised within uh, about 10 years. So basically, we're proposing uh, across the board measures to increase our ability from an international governance perspective to manage global catastrophic risks of uh, across the spectrum. So in terms of this intersection between climate, ecological governance, and, uh, you know, unhealthy militarism, moving towards disarmament and a true peace system in the, in the international uh, community. Uh, for example, we propose a rule of law upgrade. For example, one simple step would be to make the International Court of Justice a mandatory court. Now it's, it's optional, uh, less than 40% of UN member states have accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice Yet at the national level, this is commonplace. If you have a rule of law system, you need mandatory courts, obviously, and with proper enforcement, um, et cetera. Uh, we also suggest re-looking at Article 26 under the charter about uh, international system for comprehensive disarmament, uh, which was uh, forgotten essentially by uh, Security Council members, other members of the UN, um, also to have a true collective security mechanism where the Security Council itself, self is upgraded to abolish the veto, to make it a more rational, legitimate, fair organization and, and body, and to have standing UN forces for peace and security, for collective security, so that individual states don't have to arm themselves in, in the very wasteful and, and very dangerous way that's happening now. So, we have these comprehensive proposals that would also uh, address uh, global climate ecological governance, for example, strengthening international rule of law, decreasing military spending. So it's a, it's, it's a quite a bold uh, and, and comprehensive set of proposals, uh, you know, when you compare it to current thinking. And I, I do find, however, many of the venues at the moment, there is uh, thinking across silos, SDGs, there is good integration of, of issues across the board, but I don't, I don't find the governance thinking bold enough uh, in terms of what we probably need to address 21st century challenges. But I think youth and global civil society can be hugely influential, like looking at these issues of peace, disarmament, climate, and eco ecological problems that are so interwoven and uh, the, the, the populations of the world would be so much better off if we, if we really address these core international governance issues, so much better off in terms of the financing, in terms of the devotion of our science, our technology, our energy, our, our, our national ingenuity and energy. You know, should we be devoting this to militarism and defense? Or should we be devoting all of this intellectual, scientific, et cetera, energy to solving the climate crisis, to solving our ecological crises, which is absolutely urgent. And we need an international cooperation mentality and a peace mentality to uh, confront and deal with the climate crisis. Uh, my, I think you just summed up the, the, the overarching challenge, which is the finite resources, including mental resources, including um, the attention deficit, um, and of course, infinite challenges. So Marie Claire, with that impossible opening, um, any last thoughts before we move to our question and answer and discussion? Well, maybe just um, kind of a reflection on what Maya also outlined and the challenges we are all seeing is that I think we as 
no matter what role we are in, we just have to be like way more ambitious in what we are demanding. And I think sometimes, especially also myself, like looking back, um, we are intimidated by, um, you know, by the systems we are operating in, and like we are limiting ourselves to think within these systems and are unable sometimes to move out. And I see it like myself, you know, when I'm like attending um, meetings of, of, of the climate uh, the climate governance process in, in, in the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that automatically I'm not thinking about peace and disarmament, right? Because like, it's just the system, how it's set. And I think like something really important that we ourselves remind ourselves, but also our colleagues and us to kind of think out of the box. How can we move forward? How can we come up with out of the box solutions? Because it's very, very easy to kind of fall into the um the tracks and they kind of just go with the water um as everyone else is going it's, it's very very easy right it's like already hard enough to get to these spaces and then once you're there you just follow um yet i think we have to constantly challenge ourselves um and, and hopefully also like find more synergies like the ones here but also like really coming together off um the webinars and kind of work together how can we create more of these synergies to work together um because ultimately it's not what's happening at, at these climate conference, but actually what's happening in between, what's happening prior and after is what's really, really relevant. And it needs to be people, architects, who are building these structures new, but also helping the old ones to kind of um, kind of take it apart um, because they're very, very powerful as they're at the moment. And we have to create um, new kind of um, yeah avenues for us to come together. And I think that's, that's just very, very important. And I just see, that more people are joining the space, which is fantastic. On the same time, there are very little people who are able to kind of go out and kind of connect to different spaces um, because it's already complex enough to understand one of the roles. Um, and I was still like learning so, so much, um, but that's why it's important to come together um, and, and support each other and remind each other um, to be more of an activist in all of the different spaces. Um, yeah, just a shout out to everyone who is here also on the call. Um, thank you so much for joining because it's an intersectional topic, but also take this out and we all do like one step more because it's really, really urgently needed and we cannot depend on others who haven't been delivering for the last um, years to do this for us. Uh, thank you, Marie Claire. Maya, I think you, you had another point perhaps to make. I think I saw your hand as well. Um, I will just say as we enter the discussion space that I'd like, that was a, a no? Would you like to okay, I'll come back to I, I just want to give Mary Claire a, a thumbs up. <laughs> I can find a thumbs up button for saying we're not being bold enough. <laughs> exactly. And that was exactly where I wanted to pick up as we enter our discussion, which is moving out of the Zoom room onto the streets, into the corridors of power, into the rooms where it happens. Um, how do we put the, the rubber where the road uh, to the road, um, as we say in the United States? I'm not sure if that uh, translates everywhere. We have a number of bold initiatives that have already been put in the chat that um, are, are thinking big and are trying to slay the demons um, at the same time as they are practical. Um, Alan Ware just put into the chat a um, state-sponsored um, initiative that seeks for universal jurisdiction, compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. You've seen several more about the flows of money to military spending, and particularly those um, on nuclear spending. And uh, we have several folks on the call also who are innovators in the space of what the United Nations could be doing in terms of peace exercise, whether peacekeeping forces, um, or other members, uh, other kinds of peacekeeping services. So all of those are on the table, and I'm really interested to hear some um, of what our audience members are doing to give action to the ideals that we've heard spoken here. With that, I'll give it over to Vanda to begin the Q&A portion of proceedings. Great. Uh, well, it's great to see um, that we've got some some great and also bold questions coming in. Uh, so I think we'll go through them as they as they were coming in, just to be fair. The first came from Esther, who's asking for any thoughts from any or all, though I don't think we'll have the time for that, of the wonderful panelists on the prospects of utilizing the Convention on the Rights of the Child to frame a kind of common space for climate and nuclear disarmament activists to work together. Uh, as I've mentioned, this is a question for any or all. Kekashan has her hand up, so I'll pass it to her. Absolutely, thank you very much. And I think that it's actually a, a really important question and also a kind of very relevant to the solution that we're seeking because Article 6.1 of the Rights of the Child states that every child 
has uh, the inherent right to life and nuclear weapons are the exact opposite of that. They're, they're harbingers of death, literally. So uh, I think utilizing that document as kind of uh, the stepping stone for creating something that encourages all stakeholders to be able to understand just how terrible uh, nuclear weapons are and where it kind of fits into the climate nuclear space. I think it's it's a I think it's a really great idea and that kind of that all children have the base human right. Utilizing that as the starting point is I think can definitely be used as a way to move forward because it also def uh, relates to other conventions on human rights and on uh, the right to a healthy environment, for example, uh, the Geneva Convention, all of that. So, yeah, I think it's a great idea to be able to kind of use the rights of the child as a way to kick start a kick start, uh, campaign to uh, abolish nuclear weapons and recognize uh, nuclear disarmament as just fundamental to achieving sustainable development. Thank you, Kekashan, for that answer. I can only agree. Um, what, a, what a great question, Esther. Is there anyone else from our um, group of panelists who would like to answer or shall we move to the next question? I see Rebecca has her hand up. Uh, yes, to answer this question um, as a US citizen, I would say that it's actually a mutually reinforcing, hopefully, um, set of goals, the United States being the sole state that has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, so as we stress disarmament goals, as we stress the impact that climate change has on future generations, recapitulating the Convention on the Rights of the Child here for what is me, to, for me at home, um, I think inserts another level into the dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't I don't see any other hands up. So let's move on to the next question. We've got a couple of more to go. And I also want to be mindful of the time. Um, Evan is asking, how can the leaders of the G20 be enlisted to focus on the future of human development and social justice? Really all over the place today with the with the questions. Um, Bill has his hand up. Perfect. Over to you, Bill. Thank uh, Well, again, uh, the G20 was this outgrowth of the G7, which then for a while was the G8 until Russia was uh, kicked out of the G8 uh, or uh, its activities in Georgia and, and Ukraine, etc. And then the G20 was an effort to bring in key countries uh, from the developing and the least developing world to the discussions with them. Um, I guess my point is that I, I think the, uh, we, we want to try and strengthen the formal institutions of global governance, and we shouldn't lose uh, sight of that. But at the same time, these informal mechanisms of governance uh, remain a very, very uh, important uh, platform for advancing uh, peace, security, disarmament, um, uh, addressing the horrific challenges humanity is going to face with climate change and, 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 and other issues. Um, but that there, I think, will be these uh, smaller groupings that will be able uh, to work. But I would come back to my original uh, suggestion that too little attention is paid to the power of the General Assembly, which ultimately is the body that has the power to amend um, the charter, uh, the world courts uh, statute, etc. Uh, and and yet, because the amendment process at the charter has the five permanent members capacity to veto anything, uh, we probably need to be looking at ways to um, isolate the changes and 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 force them to be accepted even uh, sometimes without a formal amendment process but by just us uh, strengthening uh, the reactions 
The other point I want to make again is that as we talk about money, the greatest amount of money really available is, is the global corporate uh, international transfers. And that we do need to set up mechanisms like an International Security and Exchange Commission. It addresses the issue of corruption, of fraud, uh, money laundering, et cetera. Um, and so to me, there are these uh, processes that organizations like the Citizens for Global Solutions, the World Federalists, the other organizations of the panelists here are involved with can promote and only with civil society promoting them uh, will there be um, a, a chance to force the governments to do the do, do the promoting. The last point really is that uh, um, we've came very close and we still are very close to this breakup between the north, so-called north and south, where uh, Russia, China, uh, India, South Africa, Brazil, other countries would want to set up a kind of alternative to the, what they see as the northern dominated, western dominated uh, legal order. And I think that is worth having a special session like the, today's panel on at some point. My own worry is that I believe such a split between the, uh, the developing powers, uh, well, the, the Chinas, Indias, and, and South Africa's, Brazil's, et cetera, will only exacerbate the lack of uh, international cooperation rather than strengthen that cooperation. Thank you. Thank you for, for the answer. And I also see Marie, Cla I'm so sorry, Marie Claire's hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, just adding on the brilliant point Bill made and just maybe adding to your second last point about civil society and the responsibility of civil society. Um, these countries in the G7 are all democratic countries. Um, and as much as I don't like to put any more pressure on civil society, I think it's also important that civil society is rallying around these um, gatherings to kind of um, kind of increase the attention on these thematics, because what we see is very often around the climate conference, there's a lot of momentum, you know, the media is talking about it. Um, and then when it comes to the G7 or G20 meetings, very, very often, unfortunately, these thematics fall slightly through the cracks. And I think it's also good for us to kind of, you know, like maybe like organize some protests in front of the parliament or in front of the, of the, of the whatever house of, 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 the, of the president um, to remind them about their responsibilities. Um, because I think like this is also the power we are having as much as it's like informal spaces and it's like not the governance spaces we know from the UN. Um, I think like if there is an increased pressure from civil society, this hopefully also then trickles down into um, yeah some decision making process. But ultimately, I do think it's very important to strengthen the formal processes where every country has um, yeah one country one vote, and um, which is obviously like way more important when we talk especially about climate justice and environmental justice and also global peace. Thank you, thank you for that answer. Um, all right. A next question uh, is for is for Maya. Maya, I'm hoping that you see it in the Q and A box because it's long. I won't read the whole thing, uh, but just for those of you who cannot see the Q and A box, um, Tad is asking about um, repurposing militaries for climate disaster relief and questioning, you know, national interests and how feasible all of that is, and and proposing or asking um, if it isn't a better alternative something like a standing all volunteer rapid reaction United Nations Peace Force. I think something similar was also suggested at the Global Futures Forum earlier this year. Um, so Maya, I would love to hear your, your answer to this. Yeah, um, I don't think, uh, it, you know, it's all, all in the design and, and, you know, how cogently to organize um, current national forces uh, to, you know, to start to do a bit more disaster relief, either nationally or collaboratively with other countries, which has already happened, happening uh, at the moment. Uh, when I uh, when I saw this proposal from, from the colleague about the repurpose of military uh, initiative, I, I started to send, send him as, every time I saw in the news, a military, a national uh, military, you know, helping its citizens or going urgently to to assist in, a, in an extreme weather event, 
and it was dozens and dozens of cases across across the world and in very diverse countries. So this is already happening, you know, at the national. It's just a reality. And of course, we saw in the pandemic also, you know, uh, militaries help, helping uh, at times um, in urgent situations. So I don't think it's an it's an either or. And some of the proposals I've seen is for sort of binational forces or a European and African joint force. Uh, but this by no means excludes, you know, um, uh, different UN mechanisms with a rapid reaction force, as has been uh, suggested, of course, for many, many years under Article 43, there were supposed to be these agreements for standing forces for international security action. You know, that was conceived of, of you know, classical uh, security, peace and security issues. Uh, but of course, absolutely, there's there's arguments now like how how can we have like a very different kind of sort of green helmet sort of support um, support brigade um, which is which is not you know in in live conflict situations but a, a very very different paradigm because of course also uh, different commentators are worried about the securitization of the climate and ecological field and that it would be you know an excuse of global north powers for you know. Um, territorial and other sort of geopolitical gains, uh, other, you know, by great power. So all of this has, should be done carefully and well thought through. But Tad, I'm happy to share some of the articles um, which uh, that, that, that I have seen also published by military officials um, all, and, and, and in the US, in Germany, also those who have been involved with, you know, the, the US um, engineering corps uh, uh, of, of the military, you know, the U.S. colleagues could talk more about it, <laughs> its functions in the history of, you know, U.S. infrastructure, for example. So there are interesting models to draw from, but it's really how to to architect things properly to use use our resources again for contemporary challenges. Thank you so much, Maya. And if you could drop some of the links into the chat, if you if you have them um, somewhere. <laughs> on hand, I think that'd be that'd be very beneficial. Um, I see Jorgen's hand up. Jorgen, over to you briefly. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, uh, I want to remind that uh, the, uh, in 1991, the UN Department for Disarmament Affairs issued a report on conversion of the military resources for the environment. Yeah, and that uh, was uh, uh, planned for the Rio conference uh, in 1992, one year later. Um, and uh, this this report was finished. Uh, I was involved in this report in 91, but it was not used for the Rio conference, uh, which was in environment and development, because some countries were hesitant to use military resources for environmental purpose, even under the heading of conversion. Um, and actually, since then, the uh, uh, disaster management is often less left to national military forces. Uh, every nation has its own forces which intervene in a military in a natural disaster or environmental crisis. Uh, and uh, and uh, there are even some some military forces that are trying to organize themselves in the future to develop uh, resources to. Yeah, intervene in such disasters. Um, and uh, so it, can, it could possibly reduce conflict, but it could also increase conflict if military forces intervene in a so-called natural disaster. And But it's a challenge of the future to put this under the United Nations heading and the United Nations develop some resources that they can help to protect and, and intervene in such uh, disasters. Thank you. Bill, over to you, but I'll ask for just a brief answer as we need to be mindful of the time. Thank you. Yeah, uh, quickly, as um, Maya and, and you're going to said, the discussion of creating a UN uh, standing peacekeeping force has been on the table for decades. It is more relevant now. Uh, the one that some of us have put forward uh, two decades ago included not just peacekeeping after the Security Council's agreed to a peacekeeping operation, but also a for disaster and humanitarian disasters, whether it's floods or uh, refugees like uh, what happened in Myanmar, et cetera, but a standing force 
of several thousand at the UN that could be deployed within a matter of days rather than a matter of months. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And now I'll pass it over to Rebecca for the second half of the Q&A. Uh, thanks so much, Fonda. And uh, I will, we will keep to time for the session, so I'm not sure that it will be a, a full half. But I'd like to switch over to my, my friend and colleague David Gallup's uh, question in the Q&A which relates to the intersection between justice movements and the crises that we've been talking about around peace, climate, and disarmament. And David, if I may unpack uh, a little bit more, and, and forgive me if um, I'm not staying true to the authorial intent of your question, but as we see crises unfolding, often human rights that are derogable can be derogated. As we have had this conversation just now about UN, a permanent UN peacekeeping force, we also know the ills of past peacekeeping missions. At the same time uh, that we are dealing with current crises of aggression and crises um, of potential nuclear action, we are trying to build the infrastructure for accountability for those same crises. Um, of course, we see this in Ukraine and hopefully we are seeing it elsewhere in the world, Myanmar, et cetera. So for all of our panelists, I'd like uh, to hear your reflections on how we can keep human rights and justice in mind as we tackle these, um, these SDGs um, that are not related necessarily on their, their face to SDG 16. So Michaela has her first hand raised. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a very important question because I think, as you know, our nuclear uh, history has left a lot of damage to um, a lot of marginalized communities, namely in the global south. Uh, we have, um, you know, the Marshall Islands that have been impacted, Kazakhstan, uh, Algeria, um, and many other places, Christmas Islands by uh, the nuclear powers. Um, so justice is very much in order. And um, there's also policy structures for this right now um, with the uh, the nuclear ban treaty, the TPNW, which actually has uh, Article 6, which is very progressive and revolutionary. Um, and it states that uh, there needs to be um, victim assistance and environmental uh, remediation to the individuals and areas under their jurisdiction or control affected by the use or testing of nuclear weapons. Um, so I think that Article 6 of the TPNW is a really great tool um, that needs to be implemented. And I think, you know, one of the sort of weaknesses of the TPNW is really uh, that it's so new uh, and there's not really that many uh, infrastructures for implementation, um, but the policy and the infrastructure sort of agenda setting is there, right? It's written down on paper. And I think it's very much up to civil society to push this um, for people on the ground, grassroots organizations to really ensure that this gets um, implemented because it's so, so important to uh, really use our tools on the policy level because they are there, um, but we really need to uh, to start using them and having some accountability and, and justice because it's a strong intersection with the nuclear disarmament movement and also the very um, tragic and horrible history of testing. Thanks, Bill. I see you're off mute, Bill. Um, and I thought you might have some thoughts along these lines about the intersection of justice with some of the other goals um, and existential challenges that we're speaking of. But I don't know if that was accidental that you were off mute. <laughs> well, I was just writing something on, on this issue. <laughs> uh, I think it is, it, it's, it's extraordinarily the development in the last 35, 40 years of international justice. Uh, whether it's the European Union's systems, um, the International Criminal Court, uh, other, other systems. And I do think this is very important. And what I was writing, and we'll maybe be able to finish in a few minutes, is, is that perhaps the way we have systems to rate democracies globally, we ought to try and get a project amongst groups to evaluate and rate uh, court systems judges around the world at the national level, the regional level, and at the international level. Because the problem very often is judges get appointed who are simply tools of the leaders or of a uh, political opposition class or, or a political class, et cetera. So to me, uh, there would be just a, because right now the court systems get 
integrated into the overall democracy uh, evaluation. But I think separating it out would be very helpful. Obviously, Israel would be a very crucial point right at the moment. Um, but all sorts of national systems fail in, in their democracy because their, their courts are not allowed to be in, independent and have uh, in, integrity uh, evaluations. So thank you. And and beyond domestic jurisdictions as well, Bill, this is what we see right now with the independent expert review of the International Criminal Court, for example, an attempt to um, enhance uh, the the vetting process, the the process um, of uh, depoliticization of judicial selection. And I know that you're integrally involved with that effort, as are many of our partners. Um, there is one question in the chat that I think is best commended to our friends at PNND and elsewhere regarding litigation with respect to nuclear weapons. Um, I think it's probably going to be a voluminous response, um, Pae Benson, and so and and they they do have quite a lot of resources on that issue, um, both at the domestic and regional and uh, also international level. Um, so perhaps if I could ask friends uh, to respond to that question in the chat. Coming up on time and knowing that we have a little bit of housekeeping to do before we leave, um, I'd like to pose one last question for, for all of our panelists, which is that we periodically see what could be flashpoints for change on any of the issues and all of the issues that we've discussed today. So how does one take a flashpoint and turn it into an inflection point or a tipping point for systemic, sustained change, reform, and growth? And whoever wants to tackle that first, I'm just going to go once again with hands or whoever comes off mute, who's ever brave enough. Kakashan, please. Yes, uh, you know, as always, I'm as a really strong proponent of education and disarmament education, just to reiterate that without knowledge and without understanding and awareness, you cannot take action. So that is always going to be the first step, and particularly with so many communities around the world not having equitable access to education. I mean, obviously, that is really the first step that is required, and then understanding how we can harness that education to create change makers across uh, the world. And I actually very quickly wanted to answer the justice question as well, if I uh, may, uh, with using an example. So in 1977, the U.S., uh, built uh, a dome on Island, which is part of uh, the Marshall Islands, and that was to store the radioactive waste that came from all of the nuclear tests that it had conducted. And now uh, it shows that the dome has several fissures that are getting worse as a result of uh, the rising Pacific temperatures due to global warming, and it's letting that radioactive waste seep into the soil and into the water uh, nearby. So if that continues, obviously that would be absolutely catastrophic. And with the amplified impacts of climate change, especially on small island developing states like uh, Brunet Island and the Marshall Islands, it would it's it would be absolutely catastrophic for the people. And it's already been so. That is literally why having a more human-centered approach is so important and the justice-centered approach is so important because it shows us the links between all of these uh, supposed separate issues. But just with the example of Runet Island, it's climate inequity and nuclear injustice kind of just put into this one uh, big uh, this ball of catastrophe. And relating to the current question that you did ask of what, how can we take action? Again, people don't know about stories such as this. So awareness, raising education, and then turning that into grassroots action is what would help propel us towards a nuclear, justice, nuclear weapons free future for all. Would any of our panelists like to have the last word on that or any other question? Not, yes, Jürgen, please. Yeah, maybe shortly. I think it's very important to develop uh, international uh, and national legal mechanisms against these various climate and nuclear and military threats and uh, some examples have been mentioned, like climate uh, litigation measures, 
um, as well as uh, international court decision, um, as well as uh, the potential for banning ecocides it has not been suggested today, but I think the ecocide, banning ecocide is possible as part of the international criminal court activities. And there are also activities from the International Law Commission for the protection of the environment and armed conflict and so on. There could be various other activities where the environmental and the military nuclear threats could be uh, restrained and uh, eliminated. And ultimately, I think we have to deal with the biggest uh, concerns and threats of our times, which is uh, the different risks of the fossil fuels and the different risks of the nuclear fuels, both in terms of military and civilian. Uh, implications, and that means we have to work towards a double zero solution of uh, uh, getting rid of the fossil and the nuclear risks. In addition to the links that are being put in the chat, um, uh, pertinent to Jurgen's comments, and I saw a uh, bill, your applause as well, I'll include the Independent Expert Commission um, on the Crime of Ecocide for the ICC in the chat as we move to Vonda for our closing. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'll promise I'll be brief. Um, I would just, well, briefly like to thank not just all, obviously, the very active attendees. Thank you for being here and spending your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are with us. But of course, a huge thank you to all of our panelists for being here, for sharing your expertise, for not being scared of our questions and ask, answering them such positively. It really, this event's really given me a lot of, a lot of hope. So thank you all for that. Um, if you haven't had enough, um, we will hold a second session of this event timed for the more for the Asia Pacific um, time zones next Thursday, July the 20th at 5 a.m. UTC. Um, so if you do the math on whatever time zone that is for you, but we have all the correct times on, on the website. Um, I would also like to invite you to Youth Fusion's upcoming events. We'll hold a hybrid side event at the NPT PrepCom in Vienna on August the 9th. We'll be discussing the importance of youth inclusion and diversity in the UN spaces, but also we'll present um, some of the projects that our fellows at the Youth Hotline project came up with this summer and that are devoted to both um, disarmament education, but also addressing the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Um, and a final reminder that this event was indeed recorded and the recording will be available on our YouTube page if anyone wants to give this all a rewatch. Um, so with that, thanks everyone for being here. Thank you for a lovely evening, afternoon, morning, and have a great rest of the day. And again, thanks everyone for joining. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.